Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Matthew Petrusic, Senior Director of the Word on Fire Institute and the host of the Word on Fire show. Thanks for joining us. Alone and more miserable than ever. A recent article in the Atlantic Magazine highlights the crisis of isolation befalling the United States. Despite frequent contact by text and on social media platforms, Americans have never been or felt more solitary, especially the younger generations. And the consequences are often fatal. Loneliness is a major cause of the recent spikes in depression, anxiety, and suicide, which are at unprecedented levels. Smartphones are often identified as the culprit, but the source of the problem runs much, much deeper. The fracturing of the relationships that once embedded us in thick, concentric circles of family and friends in a larger community can also be traced to a fundamental misunderstanding of individualism and what it truly means to be a fully flourishing human person. Today, to discuss the loss of our social bonds and how Catholic thought can help heal and reunite us is Bishop Robert Barron. Well, Bishop, wonderful to have you in the studio again. Uh, today we're going to be discussing healing antisocial America. Hmm. But before we get in, what have you been up to recently? Oh, a few different things. I was uh, I was overseas, and uh, then I came back from that trip, and I stayed in Washington for a couple of days because the USCCB has meetings in March if you're a committee chair. And one thing I did there was we filmed the first of these roundtables on mental health. So we're having a whole initiative around this question of why are so many young people experiencing depression, anxiety, suicidal tendencies? So we recorded the first of these. I was on with two um, psychologists. And the idea is to bring pastoral voices, bishops, and the mental health professionals into conversation. Just did that. Then a couple of days ago, I was here in my diocese in a, in a beautiful church and um, installed three young guys as lectors. So it's one of the offices as they make their way toward the priesthood. So that was, uh, that was a great joy. Well, your work in Washington, D.C. is certainly applicable to what we're talking about today. Yeah, quite uh, so right. There's yeah. A, a lot of our conversation is going to be based on an article uh, that recently appeared in The Atlantic called Why Americans Suddenly Stopped yeah. Hanging Out by Derek yeah. Thompson. And in the article, he offers some very startling statistics about just how um, isolated we have yeah. become across, across all demographics. Uh, and we'll look at some of those stats in a moment. But the first question to ask, Bishop, I think, just to, to sort of establish the, the arena is, well, why should anyone care about individuals increasingly choosing to become solitary in the first place? Because presumably, no one's forcing anyone into their bedrooms to yeah. scroll catatonically on their phone in the dark. So it, one sort of first critique may be, well, why don't we just let people do what they want to do? You do you, uh, and I'll do me. Yeah, I'm not going to force anybody, but I can observe that something runs counter to human nature. So a basic instinct of Catholic social teaching is that we're we're social animals. That goes back to you know Aristotle, but was picked up certainly by the church and has strong biblical roots too. So that by our nature we seek um, companionship, we seek communion, and so if something is driving us into isolation, that's finally going to run up against uh, the basic instincts of our nature which in turn is going to give rise to all kinds of psychological suffering. So I, I would say we take Catholic social doctrine seriously and that we're, we're political animals. Uh, I go back to my years of studying Aristotle. You know, the zoon politicon is one way uh, Aristotle characterizes the political animal. But the other one, he says zoon logicon. You know, we, we say the rational animal, but logicon means logos is tongue, an animal that speaks, right? So that speech which takes place indeed in a political framework. Right. That's where we speak to each other in this persuasive way. It's very important uh, to know that about our nature, that we're, we're designed for communication. We're designed to reach out to others, right? So whatever is isolating us and limiting our capacity for that connection, that's ultimately dangerous to us. That's a, that's a fantastic bridge to my next question here. Um, as you frequently noted in your work, uh, autonomous choice is one of the fundamental mm -hmm. characteristics of the contemporary modern conception of, of what it means to be an individual self. Yeah. And uh, perhaps this is not the case anymore, but historically speaking, 
individualism has been lionized in American mm-hmm. culture. We can think of quintessentially American thinkers like uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson yeah. and Henry David Thoreau as both embodying and promoting the kind of radical individualism that says, well, I'm going to set myself apart both mentally and physically right. uh, from the group. And we also tend to prioritize economic opportunity over, mm-hmm. over being and staying with family. So how does this conception, this historic conception of individuality, uh, especially in a U.S. context, compare with a Catholic conception of what it means to be an individual? Yeah, it's a rich and complex question. We could do a semester course just on that. You know, there's a play. I go back here to um, Paul Tillich, the theologian, who said one of the basic ontological polarities, that's the way he put it, is between individualization and participation. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a natural tension, if you want, between I, me, my life, my choices, on my own, don't tell me what to do. Fine, that's legitimate. But that's in in creative tension with participation, which means I belong to something bigger than myself. I belong to a family, to a community, to a society, to a religion. Um, And on Tillich's reading, those two are in a a creative and healthy tension, never resolved, you know, this side of, of the eschaton. And I think that's a fair way to talk, too, in terms of Catholic social teaching. We're not talking about some communitarianism that just negates the individual. Well, no. You know, I go right back. I preached on this not long ago. That wonderful passage from Ezekiel. So, um, so we're talking, you know, 6th century B.C. When Ezekiel says, you know, if, if you sin, well, then you're responsible, not your children. If your father sinned, you know, that's his responsibility. It doesn't come to you. And we might say, well, you know, of course. But that was a major breakthrough in consciousness. It's, it's Karl Jasper's axial period, right? The, around the same time when the Greek philosophers, when Socrates and company, are emerging. So there's this breakthrough in the Israelite prophetic consciousness that we're not just, just members of a community. We also stand on our own. So that's the tension you want to respect. Catholic social teaching certainly holds to the, the primacy and the dignity of the individual and that we do have a distinctive profile. When I can say, no, that's my choice, and that's something I decided to do morally, and I bear responsibility for it. Great. But that individual is not the sort of modern individual, you know, surely autonomous and and self-reliant and all that. No, no, the individual now belongs in dialogue with something that he participates in. So I, I would see that's the healthy tension we want. So someone who may not uh, know Catholic social thought well, especially the, the anthropological element that yeah. you're, you're uncovering here, uh, may read something, for example, by St. Thomas Aquinas. So he writes in uh, On Kingship, uh, It yeah. is natural for man more than for any other animal to be a social and political animal uh, to live in a group. So the contemporary ear may hear that and say, well, no, actually Catholic social thought is sort of pedestaling the communal good or or maybe even sort of in a, in a communistic framework, uh, the, the communal good is more important than the individual good. Is it, you're well, saying no, that's not an accurate portrayal. No, because I mean, the same Aquinas who said that would also clearly hold to the integrity of the individual in his or her moral choices and you know, would certainly follow Ezekiel's instinct from the biblical period. So no, it's, it's, the, it's the both and. Probably what's more needed today is the communitarian uh, emphasis because, see, we're on the far side of that great split by which the pre-modern was left behind and the modern was embraced. You could pursue it metaphysically if you want, where metaphysically speaking, things were seen as individuals Mm -hmm. without essential relationship. Prior to that, go back to Aquinas' participation metaphysics, and things are seen as, as always already connected to each other, you know? So that makes a difference. But I think Aquinas is a, is a bridge figure there. I mean, he would certainly affirm all that we want to affirm about the individual and his uh, you know, communitarian aspiration. Another complexity that we see in, in Catholic uh, thought in general with regards to the question of loneliness and what it means to be an individual is the fact that our tradition holds up some individuals who choose radical solitude yeah. as saints, so, so hermits, yeah. you know, someone right. like uh, St. Anthony the Great. So recognizing that there potentially is a place for moral and spiritual greatness in solitude, how do we make a distinction between positive solitude and and negative solitude? No, that's good, because it's not like an isolation for the sake of isolation. I mean, all those people like Anthony of the Desert or, you know, the great uh, 
people that uh, the Carthusians and so on, they're not seeking their own private space so much. They're seeking a place to pray, and prayer, which links them to God, necessarily links them to everything else. Mm -hmm. So coming out of that her hermetical and, and um, uh, monastic tradition is often a keen sense of social responsibility, you know, and praying for the world. I think that the way of Anthony of the Desert, you know, gives rise ultimately to monasticism as people came to join him in that life. And then through people like Athanasius, who wrote about him, and Augustine, who emulated him, the whole Western monastic tradition comes. From that comes, in many ways, Western civilization. So I would say what you see in Anthony is not a sort of, as you say, self-isolating, scrolling through your your um, Facebook feed. It's a it's a very fecund. It's a it's a very fertile sort of uh, isolation for the sake of the kingdom. Along those same lines, how do we give from a, a Catholic perspective an account of the the good of silence itself? So we yeah. can think of some religious orders that impose silence. How do we how do we reconcile that with Aquinas's conception that we are speaking creatures? You know, drawn from Aristotle. Yeah, I, it's just the rhythm between them. You know, and and the thing is, it, within the mystical body, I think it's fine that some people are hyper dedicated to one of these great ideals. So I'm glad we have. Trappist, and I'm glad we have very talkative people. I'm glad we have some who are relatively isolated, some who are radically communitarian. That's kind of the Chestertonian insight, too, that within the mystical body, there's room for all this. The trouble is trying to impose, let's say, one's particular uh, spiritual inspiration on the entire church. I go back there to something Cardinal George said, which has always stayed in my mind. He said, just as I, I'm very glad there are celibates in the church, I'm also very glad not everyone's a celibate. And then he compared that to a pacifist. He said, I'm glad there are pacifists in the church because they witness to the way we will all live in heaven. But I'm also glad he said, that not everyone's a pacifist because you need some people in society not to be pacifists. So I think that's the rubric under which we should read all that. I'm glad there are trappists. Also glad not everyone's a trappist, you know. Um, there's the both and again. It seems to point to Catholicism's great power to reconcile what are only apparent uh, contradictions in the body of Christ. Yeah, I mean, Chesterton was the great master of that, I think, of, of paradox. And, and he saw the, the beautiful tapestry, which is not just things in isolation next to each other, but a really integrated view. Um, what's that lovely line he has about, you know, because a, a, a saint fasted in the snows of the north, they throw flowers at his feast day in the south. Right. It's lovely. It's a lovely sense of, of the Catholic um, integration. What's what's within Catholic thought so important about physical contact, being in yeah. physical, sort of, we can even say incarnational community yes. with each other? Well, that's, that's the answer, right? It's very important, isn't it? Because they, what these machines have done to us, and we're all addicted to them. I, I, you know, they were designed to be addictive, right. and we're yeah. all addicted to them. And screens, screens serve a purpose. Look, we're on a screen right now, so I get it. I get it. I mean, it, it can be used very well, but it does distance you. And right, we're embodied spirits. We're not just spirits. We're not just bodies. We're embodied spirits. And the body is the, is the vehicle by which uh, you come to know me and I come to know you. So right now you're hearing me speak and you're looking at me and you're watching gesture and so on. Uh, and we know this psychologically. People die from lack of, of physical contact. So I think that's a deeply Catholic sensibility. And the screen culture is dangerous from that standpoint. I, I quite agree with that. It's, that's why we have, to, we have to limit screen time. Don't eliminate it, you know, but you have to limit it. And I think parents, I mean, you know that. Um, but the whole society, I think we should be sensitive to how, how involving these things are in an addictive way. Right. What about the role of the family in, uh, in the proper individual development? Um, should we understand the family as a kind of voluntary association that we choose or something that's, that's given to yeah. us or, I suppose, well, both? Well, that's closer, isn't it? Yeah, it's given to us. And, and there's, see, I like the fact that the American thing is very much on, you know, my choice, and yeah. I'll decide. I will enter into this. But there's always, in, inescapably, an always already quality to life. The fact that you and I are speaking English here, we didn't choose that. You know, I, mean, I chose to study English in the course of my life and choose to, chose to deepen uh, my sense of it. But it was given to us. It's a world that we were born into. Um, 
I think Catholic social teaching recognizes that. There are certain givens to life, one of which is our connection to each other. Um, willy-nilly, we're connected through God to each other. Um, I belonged to, to a church from the time I was a kid. My, I was baptized into it long before I was capable of anything like choice. Good, good. That's acknowledging these, these truths. I was a member of the mystical body long before I could choose anything, mm-hmm. right? Just as I became an English speaker long before I could choose to speak English. Um, I think that's, there we go back to Tillich again, one of the other polarities he identifies, he calls it freedom and destiny. So freedom, we, we all get that. Destiny meant this givenness. Mm-hmm. You're given. I used to, when, I, when I taught that years ago, I used to use the example of my becoming a priest. I would say, you now, did I become a priest freely? Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't hesitate for a moment to say that. Uh, if I tried to get out of my priestly vows, I'd have a very hard time because I know I freely entered into them. But by the same token, was it an utterly free, you know, self-creating decision? Well, of course not. I was born into a Catholic family with pious parents, went to Catholic schools, exposed to certain influences, et cetera, et cetera. So you could say, oh, well, you were kind of destined. Yeah, I was in a way, and I entered it freely. And and it's those two things play off each other all throughout right. life. As I'm sure you know, uh, the French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre famously yeah. said that uh, hell is other people. Right. <laughs> so what, why Sometimes is he... Sometimes we all feel that way, I <laughs> yeah, suppose, right. in it's our a, Sartrean it's, moment. Yeah. Sympathetic to that position sometimes. But why, right. why fundamentally is he wrong? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a desperately sad thing to say. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, again, I get it. I'll, I'll give Sartre credit for a certain amount of honesty in saying that, because there are times you feel that way. If I could just... Think of you know, his autobiography is called Les Mots in French, words. He was a kid that... He, obviously brilliant, and, and loved words and loved the world opened up by books. And that's where I think he felt most at home. And other people, les autres, <laughs> like that, no, no, I don't want that. Um, no, no, we can't say that, though, because we're, we're destined. Aristotle was you know, a, much, a much finer and deeper reader of, of uh, human nature. And, of course, the Bible, too, understand that. You, you, you can't isolate yourself. In fact... Um, if heaven looks like love, right, then love is other people. I mean, heaven is other people. Right. It's the opposite of hell. Uh, and the deeper I come into contact with God, the more I'm connected to everything that God loves. Right? Why do I love everybody? Well, I love God, and love, and God seems to love those people, so I'm going to love them too. Uh, that's a deeply Catholic sensibility. So let's turn back to the, uh, the article, Why Americans yeah. Stopped Hanging Out. Uh, the author, Derek Thompson, unsurprisingly traces much of the causes of antisocial behavior to technology, which you've already yeah. been touching on. But this, this stat also <laughs> jumped, up, uh, jumped out at me, and I, I like your, um, your impression of it. So according to Thompson, uh, the average time Americans spend with their pets, uh-huh. their pets, has roughly doubled in the past 20 years. And this is a specific citation. He says, the average woman with a pet, so speaking specifically about women, spends more time actively engaged with her pets than with any other people on any given day. So it may sound absurd to ask you this, Bishop, but the, the data requires me to, to do it. Is regular contact with an animal an adequate substitute for contact <laughs> with another human being? I would say no, and I say it as a, as a dog lover. I had a, a dog as a kid. I love dogs and love you know pets. But right, if we're the... We're the um, the, the logical animal, the animal that speaks, right. that's that's where we have our, um, that's that's where the contact is made. I mean, you can speak to a dog, but it's rather limited. Uh, no, it's, you know, Thomas More's line, you know, from Man for All Seasons, that to serve God wittily in the tangle of our minds. And when you engage with somebody else, there's a deep, you know, satisfaction that comes from that. And the connection of the heart, uh, core ad core loquitur, you know, Newman's famous, Model, but that's important, isn't it? That heart speaks to heart. Um, so no, you're not going to find satisfaction with a with a dog or with your computer screen. You can only find it really in in friendly conversation with another. Uh, that's not just like an information gathering exercise. It, it's a soul enhancing exercise when you sit down and really engage somebody in conversation. And again, that's a lost art. I'm afraid. I don't want to be picking on the young people, but um, when you're raised on these stupid machines, um, 
you you lose that capacity, yeah. right? Even to pick up the social cues or, or how to engage in a conversation, how to start a conversation. Uh, the sheer pleasure and joy of, of following another as you're both seeking for the truth. If, if something's just kind of given to you on that screen and you just sort of are scrolling through it, you're not conversing. Now, can these machines be a means to um, cultivate conversation? Yeah, they can. They can. Um, <laughs> the, trouble, the trouble there, I think, is they often turn mean. You know, uh, what people are able to do in these con boxes is just share invective, you know. But the art of conversation, I think for parents to teach their kids how to do that, for teachers to, to teach their students, here, here's how you converse with somebody, you know. Here's how you make an argument even. I've talked about that. I think it's lost art. We, we know how to hurl invective at each other and hurl insults and one-liners and TikTok little things. But how do you actually make an argument and, right. and present your case for something? Um, so I think that's a very important theme, conversation, conversation among friends. The great tradition has recognized that as key to our flourishing. There's also the, the question of nonverbal communication as yeah. well. One thing that screens have done is has uh, yes. taken away our capacity to look at each other in yes. the eye for a sustained period of time. And that's a, that's a subtle business, isn't it? It's a yeah. subtle right. game. And it is a game. The way you learn how to play basketball or how to play chess or something, it, it's a game with a lot of um, kind of undefinable elements and uh, more intuitive. But you're right. I mean, how do you pick up on, on cues and, and the psychology of someone? How do you know, like, okay – I've just heard his feelings in saying that. And likely we're going to get derailed now because he's going to get defensive. Or that sort of delicious moment when you realize, I'm not trying to impress someone. We're actually looking for the truth together. And we're actually making progress. Like we're, we're climbing the mountain toward the truth together. That happens in the best conversations, as it does in the best games, right? When you're playing the game and you're not so preoccupied with – my own ego accomplishment, but just the joy of the game, right. right? Those are the best moments in life in some ways. And if we lose that in our conversational uh, capacity, that's a tragedy. So here are some statistics yeah. I think are important to get on the, on the table to emphasize some of the points you've been making. Uh, so according to a recent national poll, Americans on average spend four hours and 37 minutes per day Yeah on their smartphone and that for Gen Z, so that for those born after 1997, that goes up to, this is average per day, uh, six hours and five minutes. So there's one way we can look at technology and say, well, all technology is sort of morally no neutral by, by definition. It can be used yeah. for good, it can be used for ill, but is there something unique about the smartphone that requires extra attention. Yeah, it's addictive. And you, you can see it there, can't you, in those stats? I think, too, here of Gene Twenge, the <clears throat> psychologist from San Diego, who has said there's a tight correlation between screen time and depression. The higher the screen time, the deeper the depression. And I think that's um, right. It strikes me as right. Even as I'll confess it, I get drawn into these things too. They're designed that way, and you, you end up. You're, what are you looking at? Yeah, right. Ninety-eight percent of it is a waste of time, but you're you're looking at it. Um, no, I think it's very dangerous, and that's why parents, especially, ought to be I think hyper careful about how kids have access to these machines. You know, in a way, it, with all these things, though, it's a bit like you're shaking your fist at the at the blue sky because. Um, what are we going to do? I mean, they're there, right. like it or not. And kids who were raised on them, they're not going to heroically eschew them and go off into the desert and, you know, <laughs> they won't. So I don't know. I don't have a good answer to that. It's like any technology. Um, I remember when I was in Rome years ago, we had a conference on all this stuff, you know. And a Polish bishop got up and said, my grandmother used to say, this is like back in 19, whatever, 10 or something, that the telephone was a very inelegant form of conversation. And he said, well, of course it is. <laughs> and his grandmother knew that. It wasn't like having a high-level conversation. But what are we going to do? We're not going to say, well, let's get rid of telephones. You know? So I, I do wrestle with that. And look, we're using it now. You know, I mean, I, I use it in my ministry. So I, I don't think it's all bad by any means. It can and should be used. And look, at some of these Maybe they're better, these long-form kind of podcasts where people listen for hours right. to, you know, fairly high-level conversation. Fair enough. How's that different than Illinois farmers standing out in the fields listening to Lincoln and Douglas debate, you know, in 1858? I don't know. Maybe it's not that much difference. 
So it's got to be monitored. Mm -hmm. uh, we we can't just bury our heads in the sand. We can't say make this go away. Um, but I guess to you know, subordinate it to these great moral ends. So what would you say, uh, and we'll, we'll move to a conclusion soon after this, but what would you say to those who look at Word on Fire, uh, the, the ministry, the commitment we have to, a commitment to, to, to new media, and say, well, we're actually just feeding the beast. We're, we're contributing to individuals' addictions to their phones by providing so much content that's meant to be consumed on smart devices. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say, in light of all that we pointed out, yes, it's a danger. I'll admit that. But at the same time, you know, these things can be used for the good. And I, I think ours, please God, is that. So, you know, it's a, it's a both and. I, I don't think there's a super easy demarcation we can make. Um, but, yeah, I, I'd like people to, especially young people, learn how to play, like, outside, <laughs> basketball and football. And it's more than just getting your body involved. It's all the social cues thing. I, I think of all the ways, as a kid, I learned about human nature by playing basketball with people and playing tennis and football with them. Um, so I would encourage them, use some screen time. You know, one thing we've done, this is in the new uh, program for priestly formation, we have the propedeutic year, so-called, which is like a novitiate year. So anyone approaching the priesthood. And um, one of the features of the propedeutic year is fasting from social media. Hmm. So in some cases, they actually take the phones away from students, other ways they, they limit them. But here's what I find interesting. To a person, I was just talking to the rector the other day about this. To a person, the kids like it. They say that's what was most important about the propedeutic year, that we were fasting from social media. So, you know, a fast might be in service of a more um, careful, balanced usage. So I fast for a time that I might learn, okay, there's a balanced way to do this. That's what I'd want, I think. So um, your uh, role, of course, is uh, Bishop of the Diocese of Winona, Rochester. I'm sure you hear from, um, from those in your diocese, look, Bishop, we are trying to create more events to get people together in person, but we're having such difficulty getting them yeah. to show up. Yeah. Uh, what kind of advice do you offer to get us together more? Yeah, I, we do wrestle with that, you know, because the culture's changed. Uh, years ago, people would come <clears throat> to the parish or come to church readily. They don't as much. And young people are drawn inward by their machines. <clears throat> I don't know. I think, I always say truth, beauty in the Catholic tradition. Uh, the beauty of our faith, the beauty of our churches, uh, the beauty of, of music and concerts and things that would draw people, um, the beauty of our, of our great cathedrals. So I, I think that would, would draw people out of their isolation. Also, you know, the service of the poor. Uh, young people seem to respond well to that. Give them opportunities mm -hmm. to serve the poor. Uh, but I, I know, I get it. I get the, the struggle there. Well, it's now time for our listener question, Bishop. Okay. We have a question from Owen, who's 10 years old. He's from hmm. Massachusetts, and he's asking a question about... God, uh, us having free will, God knowing that we free will, and what's the relationship between okay. our free will and God's knowledge of it? Hello, Bishop Balin. My name is Owen from Massachusetts, and I'm 10 years old. My question today is, I know we have free will, but does God know what choices we will make? That's a good question, and that's a good voice, isn't it? He should be a, he should be a preacher, <laughs> Owen. Um, Charming voice. You know, it, it's a, it's a <clears throat> classic question. Here's a, a quick way to respond to it. Uh, what I'm knowing right now is not limiting anyone's freedom. So I'm taking reality in right in front. I, I, my knowledge of what you're saying is not limiting your freedom. Well, that's the way God knows everything. God knows everything, not so much from the past looking to the future, but God knows everything in one great glance. So Aquinas talks about the um, the eternal now. So that's that's the world that God lives in. And so he can know everything without thereby determining everything that he knows. Well, thank you very much, Owen, for reaching out to us. If you would like to ask Bishop Barron a question for a future Word on Fire show, please visit askbishopbarron.com. That's askbishopbarron.com, and we would really love to hear from you. Well, Bishop, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for our conversation. You're welcome. Look forward to seeing you again soon. A joy to be with you. Thanks, man. That does it for us today. 
Thanks for joining the Word on Fire show. If you're interested in learning more about how Word on Fire can help you grow closer to Christ, become a better evangelist with and for others, and work for the common good, consider joining the Word on Fire Institute. Check us out at institute.wordonfire.org. That's institute.wordonfire.org. We'll see you next time.